Hello, I'm Kate Chabot. Welcome to SITREP, your weekly look at the big issues in defence and world affairs. After suffering some significant losses, there are signs Russia is moving parts of its Black Sea fleet away from Crimea. But could the result be a spread of the Ukraine war? There are legitimate uh, concerns whether or not this could potentially drag Georgia into the war. Because in case of Russia using Abkhazia as its uh, naval base, then Ukrainian forces will have a legitimate re- reason to attack. Mike and Simon will give us their assessments of that and look further into the problems and possible solutions of supplying Ukraine with the ammunition it needs. They have to weigh whatever 155 shell comes along and then they have to use an Excel spreadsheet to actually recalculate the ballistics to actually get the ordnance on target. And that's a 155 shell, which we supposedly have standardized over time. And the new study that says industrial training in the forces needs to be replaced with personalized learning pathways to make it more democratic. A lot of phase three, certainly in the military education space, is largely reserved for those who are being groomed for the very senior appointments. And there are potentially a lot of losers. Zidrev with Kate Chabot and Professor Michael Clark. Right, several threads to discuss on Ukraine this week. Uh, Mike, just to give us a reminder of what's going on there, Ukraine says it's just suffered its fiercest bombardment this year with 118 towns and villages attacked in one day. Yes, and there's no doubt about it. The the Russian air offensive for the winter, which we all anticipated, seems to have started. I suspect it started a little bit earlier because the weather isn't so cold yet there. Um, But I think that's because of the Gaza crisis. Quite clearly, since the 7th of October, Putin and the Russian general staff have seen this as the opportunity to make some potentially biggish gains, or at least to get onto the counteroffensive, to start the winter offensive. Uh, and while the world is turning away from Ukraine, it's not even a, a news item most days now on the main news feeds actually make some inroads into the territories that they've lost. And you can see that both on the ground in where they're pushing and particularly in this air offensive. These are pretty difficult days for Ukraine at the moment. Well, we'll talk more about artillery in a bit, but let's start with the possibility of Russia expanding the battlefront then. With the full-scale invasion happened, one of the many concerns was contagion, that other countries could be dragged into the conflict. At the time, the worry was mainly for Ukraine's neighbours and friends in NATO. But now there are worries for a country which is itself partly occupied by Russia, Georgia. Moscow has announced it's going to build a new naval base on the Black Sea coast in the occupied Abkhazia region. That raises a question as to whether Georgian territory could come under attack by Ukraine. Natia Seskuria is the founder and ex- executive director of the Regional Institute for Security Studies think tank based in the Georgian capital, Tbilisi. She's been explaining to me why it could put her country at risk. Abkhazia, as you know, is a Georgian territory that has been under Russian occupation as a result of the 2008 war uh, between Russia and Georgia. And since then, Russia has uh, declared uh, Abkhazia as an independent state. Abkhazia can be uh, targeted in case if Russia builds this naval base and in case if Russia uses this naval base against Ukraine, then Ukraine will have a legitimate reason uh, to to strike back and attack this naval base. So in this case, of course, uh, this does not mean in any way that Ukraine wants to attack Georgian territory, but they will have no options in this case because the attacks on Ukraine will be carried out from this naval base. So in this case, Ukraine will, will will have to counter-react, of course. And what is the reason that Russia wants to have this naval base here? Moscow, I, I believe, is looking to find alternative ways through which uh, it will provide more security to its fleet. As we have seen recently, there has been some satellite imagery as well uh, confirming that Russia has been uh, relocating its ships out of the port of Sevastopol in occupied Crimea. This is as a result of uh, Ukrainian attacks that have been uh, permanently ongoing, and we have seen multiple attacks over the Russian Black Sea fleet. Most recently, for instance, in September 2023, when uh, Ukrainians were able to target the headquarters of the Russian Black Sea fleet using the Storm Shadow missiles supplied by the UK and France. So this uh, could be Russia's attempt to find some I would say a temporary solution because I don't see how this could be 
uh, the best solution for Russia because Ukrainians will still be able to reach um, Abkhazia in case if Russia Russia opts for this option to uh, relocate its uh, its fleet uh, to uh, the Georgia's occupied uh, territory of Abkhazia. And can you just give us an idea of what this base might host? What, what kind of uh, naval ships would it have, and what would they, and how many? Uh, well, yes, this is a crucial question, I believe, uh, because as of today, the port uh, in Ochamchire is not deep enough. So in case if Russia wants to relocate its fleet, uh, this port will not be able to host some of its uh, large ships. So in this uh, case, uh, Russia, I believe, will have to put enough resources and considerable amount of efforts to construct this port in a way that uh, they could be able to host uh, some of its larger ships. For now, the port can host uh, some of smaller vessels, but uh, this will not be anywhere close to uh, what Russia may intend to plan in this case in terms of relocating its larger uh, vessels and ships uh, to Abkhazia. So I believe um, it will take uh, much efforts in terms of time and resources to, uh, to turn this port into a naval base. How long do you think it will take to, to bring it into operation, do you think, as a naval base? Um, it's very hard to say how long it will take. Depends on the resources that Russia is willing to put into this uh, project, let's say. Uh, but it will take uh, definitely at least uh, several months to, to turn this port into a large-scale naval base. And how's it going down in Georgia? How are people uh, feeling about this? Um, it's a very concerning development, and obviously Georgians have been concerned for many months um, and years. This is not something new. The Russian threat has been always there for Georgia because, as you know, the 20% of Georgian territories have been occupied by Russia. Uh, but obviously the war in Ukraine has raised further concerns, and this uh, kind of um, announcements about the potential na expansion of the naval base, this is um, a very concerning development because, as I've mentioned, this might drag Georgia directly into the war, into the Russian war effort. And uh, in this case, of course, uh, this will be, uh, I would say, probably the worst um, security threats that Georgia has faced since uh, the 2008 war uh, with Russia. And what about the Georgian government? What is it likely to do about it? And can it do anything about it if it wants to? Well, Georgian government has been trying to uh, play a balancing act. On the one hand, they have been uh, claiming to support Ukraine in uh, international forums, such as the UN platform, for example. And on the other hand, they have been arguing in favor of not provoking Russia. In this case, of course, uh, what Georgian government can do is to escalate this issue with the partners um, and to, to work with partners so that, for instance, further sanctions can be placed on Russia because of this uh, this new uh, initiative. Uh, but in terms of practicalities, of course, unfortunately, um, Georgian government cannot really do anything to prevent Russia from the expansion of uh, its naval base in Abkhazia because the Georgian government does not really have an effective control over Abkhazia. Natas Deskuria, thank you so much for your time. Good to speak to you. Thank you for having me. Uh, Mike, it is a what if. So how big do you think the risk is here? Well, I think the biggest risk is actually to Russia in uh, going forward with this uh, potential base or extending the base at uh, Ochinchireya. Because, the, you know, put this into context, uh, the Georgian government is not too far away from another colour revolution. It's, it's bubbling under the surface. The government's trying to, you know, hold the line in, in not provoking Russia, but also not liking what it sees. And the younger generation in Georgia are very sceptical about their own government. And the, the resentment about um, Abkhazia, where this base would be, and South Ossetia, mm -hmm. the other territory, the breakaway territory that the Russians are now trying to recognise in effect, you know, creates great problems in Georgia. And then that comes off the back of the fact that, you know, north of Georgia, Azerbaijan was able to take back Nagorno-Karabakh from Armenia a couple of months ago. There's nothing the Russians could do about it. And so there is a sense in which I think this base, being in Abkhazia, just emphasizes mm. the fact that this is a territory that the Georgians think doesn't belong to Russia and shouldn't be, I mean, you know, doesn't belong in the Russian sphere of influence. And I think it's actually could be a cause celebre in uh, any further instability within Georgia. So it, the risk to the Russians is at least as high as the risk to the Georgian government itself.
So sh should this base go ahead, could Russian ships have the same impact in the war if they move from Sebastopol to the Georgian coast, or could it blunt that capability a bit, do you think? It definitely does, yeah. I mean, the, the Russians are moving further eastwards in the Black Sea because Sebastopol is just not now viable for them. It's been attacked too often. They can't keep any, any ships of any size there, even though most of their repair facilities, their dry docks, all their infrastructure was based on Sevastopol. They've now basically lost that base. Now they've moved eastwards towards uh, Novorossiysk, which is in Russia itself, and that's quite a small port. And so they're thinking about, you know, opening up this second port at Ochenchuria, but they'll have to build a lot of dry dock facilities somewhere, either Novorossiysk or in Ochenchuria. Essentially, the Russians have been thrown out of a, a secure base in the western part of the Black Sea. And this pushes mm. them even further east in the Black Sea, so it makes them less capable. And it does represent, I think, um, a victory for the Ukrainians. I mean, you know, things are not going so well for Ukraine these days. But one area in which the Ukrainians can say they're having a growing strategic victory is getting some control back over the western part of the Black Sea. Let's also bring in Simon Newton, a Ukraine reporter for Forces News. Hi, Simon. Hello. Um, just looking at the map, the location of this planned Russian base, Ochamchira, mm. is about 450 miles from where Ukraine holds its own territory in the south. How much capability would Ukraine have to strike this new Russian Navy base if it happens? Well, as Mike says, really, obviously this, they're putting this base there for a reason. It's far beyond anything Ukraine has, has targeted before. We've seen the Ukrainians attack the headquarters of the Black Sea Fleet in Sevastopol, but they've used Storm Shadow missiles and, and French Scout missiles from, from SU-24s. But the rules of engagement, if you like, that, that they have to abide by because they've been supplied with these, they can't use these outside of Ukrainian territory. So they can't use those to hit this particular base. They, they are developing their own domestically produced missile, the Neptune, which is an anti-ship missile, which they've converted, modified to be land-based. But again, that only has a range of about 250 miles. So their range with missiles are quite limited. They do have naval drones, which we've seen them use quite successfully against the Kerch Bridge, for instance. They have a range of about 500 miles or so, carry 300 kilos of explosives. So they're pretty potent things, could cripple a ship. But I mean, I just did a, a, a as the crow flies calculation and from Odessa to Ochamchiri, that's 600 miles or so. So it's even beyond the range of those at the moment. So. The other option potentially would be some sort of internal sabotage. We saw those attacks on the Engels Air Base and the Sikov Air Base inside Russia. They were That was about 400 miles inside Russia, so they could potentially do it that way. But this, wherever they go, it is far beyond anything they've tried to target before. But knowing Ukraine as we do, they will undoubtedly try and find some way of hitting it. Mike, um, I said before, it is a what if, but were Ukraine to strike what is sovereign Georgian territory, albeit an area that Russia occupies and declares independent, what happens then? Anything? Uh, not necessarily, but that's one reason why I don't really think the Ukrainians will do it, because I think they'd be potentially, you know, alienating a, a, an anti-Russian neighbour mm. whose support they may want in any case in the future. But remember, if they decide that it's just not worth targeting this new base, it doesn't stop them targeting the Russian ships going in and out of the base. That's perfectly legitimate. And so if they can get to within range in the way that Simon was mentioning, and even, you know, using Storm Shadow or Scalp, not really good anti-ship missiles, but, uh, you know, the Neptune missile against a ship that was say 20 or 30 miles going in or out of the base that's absolutely fine they could still make this base non-viable for the russians if they can target the ships okay let's go back to the land campaign in the ukraine war and dig a bit deeper into something we heard a couple of weeks back on sit rep from colin freeman one ukrainian commander i spoke to said that he only had five artillery shells a week for his l119 which meant less than one a day Specifically, he's talking about standard NATO 155mm shells. The supplies seem to be, to quote one senior NATO official, at the bottom of the barrel. Uh, Simon, you've been looking at the problem and the possible solutions. Give us some numbers to start with. So that comment, I think, came from Admiral Dutch Admiral Rob Bauer, who's NATO's most senior military official. So it, it comes from a very uh, you know, impressive source, if you like. The, the 155 millimeter question has kind of become a litmus test, you know, a bellwether for how well NATO nations are trying to keep up with the amount of 
ordnance that Ukraine is burning through. And, and the figures are quite staggering. I think the, the Ukrainian themselves, the US puts it at about 90,000 rounds a month, 155. The Ukraine's own defence minister says it's much higher. It's about, they're saying it's about a quarter of a million, 250,000 rounds every single month that they're getting through. If you put it into context, that's about four times the production capacity of, of America and the EU combined before this war began. So it's a huge amount. Now, the Americans have already given about two million shells, but it's still not proving enough. And, and even just this week, we've seen President Biden asking for another $50 billion to ramp up production. A lot of that is going to go on trying to not just feed Ukraine, but also restock America's very bare shelves. And what's the answer to meeting the demand? So I've been talking to um, uh, Professor Jonathan Cavalli, who uh, he's a, he lectures at the U.S. Naval College in the MIT in America, and, and he's, he believes that this war is actually presenting a real opportunity to rationalise the way that governments produce and supply this less exquisite defence supplies, things like 155mm shells, basic drones, even loitering munitions. And his argument is essentially that these are pretty ubiquitous items nowadays. There's nothing really special about them and that they should be treated like commodities. I mean, he even draws this analogy in, in an article he wrote to, to toasters, actually. says they should, they're things that can be made in bulk pretty cheaply anywhere in the world. The margins are very slim, so companies will compete on speed, on, on, on cost, and that's great for the consumer. So he says rather than big primes or government ordnance factories um, making them, you should really just put production of these out to the market or at least a much bigger portion of it. The Americans are already doing this. They've got, they're have got they getting their 155s from Bulgaria, from South Korea, but he says they should be doing a lot more of that. Let the market battle it out. And that, he says that would lower the price, but it will also free up their own sovereign capability of companies, big companies like BAE, for instance, to concentrate on the high-tech military stuff that these emerging markets can't make. The goal of the suppliers, the supporters of Ukraine, is to get as many munitions in the hands of the Ukraine army as quickly as possible and as cheaply as possible while still having them function. And that's a much different project than, say, supplying even Challengers or M1A1 Abrams tanks or even sort of a high-end UAV like a Predator. If you think about who is actually going to purchase most of these shells, it's going to be the United States. The European Union and NATO. And obviously there's overlap between all three, but basically either those three actors or hopefully those three actors in concert will say, we plan to buy 4 million shells over the next three years. We would like them to meet the following standards. They have to work a certain way. They have to fit in a certain number of barrels and whoever can give them to us fastest for the best price is who we're going to go with. So his argument essentially is that governments should become uh, buyers, not not sellers, and they should just leverage the EU and the US to leverage their enormous buying power to just really squeeze the market and get this production going much faster than it currently is. Mike, uh, would Professor Cavalli's idea work? And if it were to, could governments be persuaded to go for it? Yes, they're already thinking in those terms for exactly those reasons, because um, artillery shells are pretty easy to produce. And the European Union um, has been trying this. I mean, the Commission has this scheme to, to send a million shells. A million shells have already got to Ukraine and that the Europeans will then be compensated from the European Defence Fund to restock themselves from those million mm. shells. That's a fundamentally clever idea. But as soon as that idea goes into practice, immediately it becomes protectionist. And uh, the French start to actually pull back on it and say, well, we want to make sure that all these extra shells that are being produced are being produced in our factories and so on. That's not a good thing, but it does show that it, this is one of these issues that can just can go to the market. And, you know, the Ukraine war has brought about lots of different sorts of improvisation in creation yeah. of drones and new technologies. And this is an, another form. It's, it's easily within our grasp, at least to produce lots of artillery shells and similar, you know, low level munitions through the market. And people have talked about this now for a year, but it just hasn't got off the ground quickly enough to make a difference in Ukraine. And uh, Simon, I said at the start, uh, these are standard 155 millimeter mm. shells, and yet differences are causing problems for Ukrainian forces, aren't they? Yeah, though he's, he was saying to me that rationalizing production will also help standardize the weapons that uh, they're actually going to Ukraine. I mean, there's actually 15 firms, he was telling me, that are making 155 millimeter shells across Europe alone. But what, what I didn't certainly know is that the standard, although there is a standard, is actually not exactly the same. And, he, and you've told me this story about how that's impacting Ukrainian gunners as they're fighting the Russians. It's actually pretty embarrassing for NATO because even our 155 standards aren't that great. And in fact, 
you hear these stories about units, Ukrainian units on the front line having to buy industrial scales because they have to weigh whatever 155 shell comes along to figure out what it actually weighs, what's inside it, what's shaped. And then they have to use an Excel spreadsheet to actually recalculate the ballistics to actually get the ordnance on target. And that's a 155 shell, which we supposedly have standardized over time. So again, he's saying you know, the answer to that is simple. Don't make these things yourself. At least have some sovereign capability, but farm a lot of it out and use that buying power to get exactly what you want. And Mike, uh, we are a year and a half into this war. Should we be surprised that at this point we don't seem able to supply Ukraine with the basics at the rate they need? Well, I don't think we should be surprised. I mean, it is a shock in, in a way, but it, we've seen this coming for a long time. It was clear from the spring of this year that this war was going to go into the next year and maybe the year after. And some of us have been saying on this program and others that there is a munitions crisis approaching in the autumn of 2023, where the, the Western powers are given all the things they could easily give. Then they were having to dip into their own stocks, which is starting to worry them. And the productive capacity of the Western arms industries is simply so low after 30 years of peace that they're just not producing at high levels. So here we are in a war of attrition. This was totally foreseeable and was foreseen. Not enough has been done about it. People nod sagely in, in uh, capitals when you talk about it and in meetings. Yes, they all nod. Yes, you're absolutely right. Nothing very much has been done about it. And so in a way, this is one of the reasons why Ukraine has is, is got a problem now. They've got to try to get through the next six or eight months, even if the West now grasps the nettle and puts the money into making good on the munitions crisis that is now unfolding before us as we speak. And how much is Ukraine able to make for itself at this point? Uh, some, and they're investing in a big way in new production. I mean, they reckon that they're going to have to f fight with a war economy for the next couple of generations. And that's a sensible idea. And they've got their best people, people who used to run the railways, onto their uh, industrial production for munitions. And so they are investing in it. And, they, and it's a big country. It's, got, it's had a big arms industry, very high, highly sophisticated arms industry in the old Soviet Union. So they've got the skills, they've got the management ability, if they can just do it in slightly different ways but they can't do it quickly. That's why this next year is, is, a, is a problem for them because there's a dip in all of the things they need. The only comfort is there's a dip in the Russian side too. The Russians yeah. will also this year be dependent on what they can squeeze out of North Korea and Iran and probably China because they themselves can't produce the stuff that they need. In their own arms industry, they geared it up and it's been running at about 70% full capacity, 70%, in some cases less than that, because they're so short of skills and components and so on. So they've got a problem too, but that's cold comfort to Ukraine, who were on the verge of being able to make some big advances in the autumn and now can't really do that until sometime deep into next year. And Simon, we've had uh, a lot of talk about increasing production to replace our own stocks as well as keep Ukraine supplied. Have we upped our game or, or is it all still talk and negotiation with industry? I've seen some estimates that the British Army needs a stock of around 450,000 or so, 155 million shells at any one time. That's to be able to fight a sort of 30 day battle. And that's about a billion pounds worth of munitions alone. So there's, there's a lot to be put back on the shelf. The government signed this deal with BAE that's worth about £2.4 billion over the next 15 years to increase, I think it's an eightfold increase in BAE's production. But I mean, some estimates say it will take maybe up to seven years to produce the stockpile that the army needs. And obviously we don't know at the moment how bare the shelves are and we're giving this huge amount of, uh, of shells away to Ukraine also at the same time. So the assessment seems to be that, yes, there is more than talk going on. They are buying the stuff, but we're looking at 2025, 2026 before these shelves start to sort of significantly fill back up. All right, Simon Newton, thanks so much for your time. News, discussions and analysis. This is Sitrep. Finally this week, we look at the training given to Britain's servicemen and women. A study from the defence think tank Rusi says it needs to be modernised for a number of reasons. But the thing that really stood out to us is that they say training needs to be more democratic. Sitrep's James Hurst has been looking at the study and talking to the people behind it. Uh, 
James, just uh, talk us through the findings. I mean, they say in the training system at the moment, there is a range of good and bad, but they talk about rigid industrial approaches that they say need to be changed. And, and the line that stands out in the study, they say a teacher from the Victorian age would find much that was familiar in the defence mm-hmm. training system. If we just take a step back, everyone, when they go into the armed forces, does phase one and phase two training at the start of their career. So that's your basic military training. And then you're, you're training for your specialist skills on top of that. They point out in this report, you look at the Army, it is the biggest provider of apprenticeships in the UK. The Royal Navy and RAF are both also in the top 10. So, you know, that's one of the good points that stand out. This point about democratising training really comes in at phase three. That is your training through the rest of your career to develop you and hopefully keep you in service delivering more. Now, the author of this study, Paul O'Neill, he's Director of Military Sciences at RUSI, also formerly the MOD's Head of Defence People Strategy. This is back when he was an RAF officer. Uh, he's been telling me that that later training taking you through your career it varies significantly from person to person phase three depends on what career path you're following and often postings and promotions a lot of phase three certainly in the military education space is largely reserved for those who are being groomed for the very senior appointments and there are potentially a lot of losers and The maths don't work out, so forgive me, I was never a mathematician. But if you improve the quality of 1% of your organisation, that's not a huge outcome. If you can improve the quality of 99% of your organisation, then that gives you a much better business outcome. And I think democratising learning and moving it from the few to the many would deliver, I think, much better value to defence overall. What you've just described in terms of that access to phase three, I mean, that sounds pretty unfair at the moment to some minds. Um... Some people might categorise it as that. I don't think it's necessarily unfair because it is aimed at what the defence requirement is. I just think it could be fairer. But what he says is it's not about just about making it fairer for people. He says it's also about doing better for the forces themselves and for people's effectiveness. He gives a really good example when, I, when we were chatting. So, for example, someone who's a civilian police officer, also a reservist, in their day job, they could teach restraint techniques for the police. But in the forces, they're not even allowed to apply those restraint techniques, let alone train others to do it, until they've done that military course. You know, this is wasteful, both for the individual and for the forces. Mm, it's very, very interesting, that, that contradiction there. What, what do they say is a solution then? Ultimately, more flexibility, what they call personalised learning journeys, more training of trainers so that they can actually direct their training more to the person and, and less to a flowchart, more digitisation, let, let people study in ways that suit them better and also mean that you're getting more bang for your buck out of the creation of a course, but also commercial partnerships. Now, they're already used a bit, um, but, but the authors think they offer a, a flexible way to bring in more specialist training skills. Mike, on the one hand, we know that when money and people are being stretched, training tends to be a place where savings are made. But equally, look at what we've done for Ukraine and countless other countries. Our training has a pretty good worldwide reputation, doesn't it? Yes, it does, because the armed forces themselves have a very high reputation. The training is is always uh, very specific, very detailed. And, you know, it's, it's the old idea, train hard, fight easy. The more sweat in training, the less blood you, you exert on the battlefield and so on. All those maxims come out of the British system, not just the regimental system, but the closeness of you know, the, fa- the, the squadrons and the ship um, and the, the, the unit cohesion, which is a very British characteristic. And that's a, a sort of basic for training. And if you can convey that to the other organisations you're training, the other countries that are interested in training, then that also is a, an investment in soft diplomacy for Britain for the future. So it, it does go down very well. The question is also, we're very good at basic training, infantry training, training for the basics in all in all three of the armed services, armed forces life. Are we good enough at the, at the higher level? The answer is we're not sure. And James, can the forces afford to invest more, be it money or effort, into modernised training right now? It's really interesting you, you talk about the Ukrainian training. There's an example in the report where they say in some places the capacity isn't good enough. So training just 70 Ukrainian engineers in the UK required stopping some phase three training for British troops. And the argument here is, look, it invests more and you will 
get the returns and see it in better efficiency. Things like digital courses, you know, personalized training could be shorter. But I also put this question to Lieutenant General Sir Nick Pope. We've, we've spoken to him on SITREP because he was a, a military advisor to the Haythornthwaite Review yep. of Armed Forces Incentivization. Now, again, they recommended more personalized training. And he says, you know, this is specifically for the sake of the forces themselves, not just for the individuals. Look, I mean, defence hasn't got a choice. If it wants to have an armed force which is equipped with the right people to deliver the right outputs, and defence talks about a model in the integrated operating concept and in the defence command paper, which talks about individuals who are more skilled, who are, who are going to be required to do more at length for more of the time. It can't do that on one side of the equation, up the demand signal, without thinking about the supply side. So unless it invests in the supply side, there's an imbalance in the equation. And the result is it doesn't have the people it needs? And the result is it doesn't have the people it needs. It can do this. It just requires to think systemically about the people function and the training and the education part within that. So this is a message that the government is getting from several different directions. It's also one I think that is being heard. It is one that is being spoken within the government and the forces. And just to give you an example, the army has just opened its new soldier academy at Purbright. There is a, an equivalent NCO academy coming next year. So certainly the forces and the government get the principal steps are being taken. Of course, the, the proof of the pudding is always in the eating. James, thanks for that. Um, Mike, uh, some people will hear about personalised learning journeys and think, hang on, um, isn't the strength of a military based on everyone working to the same plan with the same tools? It's about the whole, not the parts. Uh, yes, it is. And that's what you get in phase one, phase two training. But the phase three issue really is quite important because, you know, we all know of examples of um, people in the services, officers, all ranks, and they get to the age of, let's say, 30 something. And they've had a good career so far, but they know that they're probably not going to go on to the highest careers. And they say to themselves, well, I can either stay in the service and just be good at it. But then where does that leave me at the age of 55 when I retire? Or do I get out now because I'm still young enough to develop new skills to do something else? And those new skills have got, to, in a way, to be part of the career development so that it is worth staying in the forces into your 40s and 50s because it's, 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 you're not just doing forces things, you're training in skills which have a broader application to society, even though you're doing them for the forces. And I think that's a, that's a fundamental issue, which we've all seen it, people who leave the military earlier than they probably want to because they're thinking about, well, what does the military offer me for the next 20 years before I have to retire? What else is available out there? Professor Michael Clark, good to speak to you. Thank you for your time today. And my thanks to all of our guests. That is all for now. We'll be back with another SITREP next Thursday. And if you want to listen online, you can now find us on the Forces News YouTube channel, as well as our home at bfbs.com slash SITREP or wherever you download your podcasts. For now, though, from me, Kate Chibot, thank you for listening. Bye-bye. 